Hey everybody, Aaron Cowan, Sage Dynamics, and this is my review of the Shield RMS Micro Red Dot Sight. There are a growing number of offerings in the micro red dot site category, and I buy them all. Uh, my continuing attempt to be as thorough as possible when I see products come through classes, and because of the growing popularity of having a red dot on a handgun, um, people are going to attempt to save money where they can, which makes total sense because things can get expensive, and why buy something super expensive when you can get uh, a good quality from something less expensive if that's possible. Uh, when I was first asked about the Shield RMS, um, I was searching for one at the time. They were in pretty high demand, so they were out of stock everywhere. I was finally able to get my hands on one, uh, and I wanted to see if um, its attributes and its features were going to lend itself very well to the category of a micro red dot sight on a handgun, uh, more in a mind of self-defense purposes. Now, as usual, my review process for uh, micro red dot sights is going to be ongoing. But for the purpose of this video, I was gonna do my initial 2,000 round review, which includes your normal target ammunition, as well as uh, self-defense or duty carry 124. In, the, in this uh, case, I'm using it on a nine millimeter Glock 17 MOS. So I was gonna be using duty carry 124 and some 124 plus P. Initial concerns with any micro red dot sight are, is it going to be able to handle recoil? Are the battery connections specifically gonna be able to handle recoil? Is it gonna have a long battery life or a reasonable battery life? Um, is it going to lend itself well to being mounted on handguns um, uh, easily? And are there any unique features to it that give an advantage over what's already uh, out there on the market? Two of the most appealing aspects of the shield are the fact that it has a battery tray. The battery uh, can be replaced from the side versus having to remove it from the firearm to replace the battery. That's super appealing because even though the battery life is pretty decent, uh, batteries are gonna die eventually, and, and as with, uh, for example, the Trigicon RMR, you have to remove it from the gun to replace the battery, which isn't really appealing to the average shooter, and it's certainly not appealing at a law enforcement level where you have officers' guns, and you're gonna have officers at different skill levels using tools to take optics off of guns to replace batteries, and that can be problematic, and it can lead to additional damages if the, uh, the user doesn't know what he's doing, or if he just has bad luck and strips a screw, uh, something like that. Another appealing thing about the Shield RMS is its overall height, which is actually uh, quite compact. The available view window, your objective window, if you will, your pupil window being the same thing, um, is, is relatively the same size as a lot of its competitors. However, because the body is so short, uh, you can actually co-witness to a certain degree with most of your aftermarket or your, your OEM sites uh, without having to go to a suppressor height site if you're gonna have the RMS um, like in the case of the, the Glock MOS, installed on one of the, uh, the mounting plates, or if you're gonna mill the slide of your firearm to accept the shield's footprint. With the Glock MOS, the shield allowed me to co-witness with about three-fourths of the available sight picture I got from the OEM sites, which uh, any Glock owner will tell you they're more of a uh, placeholder than they are actual permanent sights because they're plastic and just simple holster wear on the front sight can actually change your point of aim point of impact over time. So it's always a good idea to replace those as soon as possible with some high quality metal sights, be they fiber optic or night sight. But for the purpose of the review, I wasn't too worried about that. I left the OEM sights on there uh, and I started the 2000 round review process. Once I got it zeroed, um, and zeroing was actually uh, kind of interesting. Uh, because the zeroing procedure on the shield, um, the packaging includes a, an actual dial wheel because there's no tactile click adjustments um, in the, uh, the mechanics of the sight. So you use this little guide wheel, almost like a witness wheel, to tell you kind of where you're at. And it is pretty helpful. Um, I would prefer, personally, more tactile adjustments with actually graduated markings uh, on the optic body to show me where I'm at so I don't need additional uh, tools to kind of figure that out in the event that you lose that little piece or, or something like that. And it would require more guesswork. Um, but that being said, it wasn't that big of a deal. I was actually familiar with it because if you're not aware, the Shield RMS is a newer evolution of the J-Point. Um, it's sold here in the U.S. as the J-Point anyway, and I had experience with J-Points in the past, not good experience. Uh, in fact, I have three of them in a drawer that are broken various failures. And I was really hoping to see, because I try to keep an open mind with all products, um, if this newest evolution offering from Shield was going to be superior to the J-Point. 
For zero distance, I went with 15 yards, which was the point of aim, point of impact on the 17 MOS. Um, zeroing was, was pretty straightforward. It probably took me, I don't know, you know, 15, 20 rounds, not that that technically matters, uh, to get the, uh, the RMS walked into where I wanted it to. And then I began the review process. The very first thing I did uh, was a burn down. Normally, uh, I use burn downs for accelerated uh, rates of fire on suppressors or uh, handguns themselves to see if they can handle that high frequency of fire in such a short period of time. But I figured since I was going to do 2,000 rounds over a period of time anyway through the RMS, I might as well get 500 out of the way as soon as possible. No issues on the burn down. Uh, 500 rounds as quickly as I could get them through the gun. Uh, the RMS maintained zero, uh, which wasn't too surprising. Um, I wouldn't expect just general uh, range fire despite the frequency to be able to affect the zero, but uh, in that 500 rounds, you had both 115, 124, 124 plus P. Uh, so if any ammunition that I put through the gun was going to cause an issue initially, it would have happened during that 500 round uh, rate of fire. The RMS has an auto adjust feature, meaning there's no manual adjustment for brightness, which usually gives me concern and usually for good reason with my experience with other optics in the past. Uh, reason being, sometimes the photo cell just isn't quite able to keep up with um, the specifics of the lighting conditions you're in. It, it kind of takes that measurement in a gross fashion, so daylight is going to adjust, darkness it's going to adjust. A lot of them don't really account for darkness or twilight conditions while using a handheld light or a weapon light. And this is something that I, I, uh, I identified early using the, uh, the RMS under low light, um, shooting it uh, indoors with uh, artificial conditions, complete total blackness with the aid of a weapon light, and then in ambient lighting conditions. The problem that I identified immediately uh, with the reticle was the fact that I was not able to pick up the dot crisply and consistently against lighter contrast backgrounds. Against like a black t-shirt on a target, I was still able to see it under, you know, an 800 lumen uh, streamlight. But if I was to adjust to uh, a lighter surface, such as more of a, of a Caucasian skin tone, if you will, I was losing the dot. Uh, against white and gray t-shirts on targets, I was also having that issue uh, consistently at distance. Usually the closer the target was, the worse it was because that, that light's going to splash back a little bit, so that's part of the issue. It's going to illuminate that target and saturate it. Um, that being said, this is not an issue I have with the duty carry uh, MRDS optics I use, and it's not an issue that I would say would be acceptable for a self-defense mm, focused handgun. Uh, can you get by and get around it? You can, but you don't really have any direct control over the brightness of uh, the optic itself. So really the only way to ensure that you wouldn't, or I could say mitigate that problem as much as possible, I don't think there's any way you could remove the possibility because you can't control the lighting conditions besides what's in your physical control, would be to use a lower output light, which to me is kind of unacceptable because I want as much light possible so I can illuminate farther and I can control people uh, at greater distances. When I got into durability testing, as usual, I try to keep the durability testing as realistic as possible. With uh, handgun mounted optics, the two things I'm going to focus on the most are manipulation, using the optic body itself to manipulate the slide of the gun, such as one-handed shooting or wounded shooting, if you will, where I'm gonna manipulate the slide off of other objects, off of my duty gear, so on and so forth. Uh, and then, of course, the other issue is can the RMS survive reasonable impacts such as the gun, you know, you set the gun on the tailgate when you get to the range, you set it on the table when you get to the range, it falls off, impacts concrete, impacts gravel, just basic, um, very, very possible uh, impacts and, and, and uh, shock that can occur to the optic itself when it's mounted on the handgun.
I did the one-handed manipulations in strings of 50 rounds, uh, meaning I would go through a series of reloads or malfunction clearances utilizing 50 rounds of ammunition with dummy rounds mixed in to induce failures of fire, perhaps double feeds, and if I was shooting right, maybe I'd get a stovepipe out of it. Now, I uh, manipulated the slide of the gun using the body of the optic off of both my duty gear and foreign objects such as barriers that I was using for cover or concealment. Uh, the first 50 round string went great. After the first 50 rounds, I put the gun back on the bag, I checked the zero, it was still zeroed as far as I could tell. The second 50 round uh, string, uh, I lost the zero consistently. Uh, it wasn't uh, that the optic was floating, it was just that the optic, or I should say the zero itself, shifted. And it stayed where it shifted, uh, which to me is kind of a big deal. Within 100 rounds of manipulation, I'd lost zero on the optic. So I re-zeroed it, made sure everything was tightened down and, and, and uh, as well as possible. Um, I didn't have any loose screws or loose tensioners or anything like that, so something within the optic itself had shifted. Maybe I, I knocked it out of the, the, the gearing system or, or however the, the internals of the, the RMS work. I haven't actually taken it apart to see exactly how their um, zero hold works. Uh, I got it re-zeroed, did another 50 round string of manipulation, didn't have any problems. At that point, it was time to get into the drop testing. For drop testing, I do it two different ways. Um, I drop the firearm like that, uh, just a traditional sideways drop, uh, more of the gun following its own natural points of, of weight to impact the ground, and I also do um, an optic upside down drop. Of course, I do this with unloaded firearm, because even though the 17 MOS is uh, drop safe, it's still a good idea to stack the deck in your favor, just in case. The first optic upside down drop burnt, bent the optic body. I'm showing that to you now. Um, then I did it again and it made it worse. At this point the optic was unusable. The dot was not being projected onto the screen. In fact the, the, the polymer lens itself had been bent considerably. Uh, this was one of my concerns going into the review is it seemed like the body wasn't going to be robust enough to handle a general impact, a uh, serious general impact such as the gun being dropped. Of course the argument can be made, well I don't drop my guns. And that's true until you do. Uh, my point is if, and I'm always looking at things from a self-defense and from a duty carry perspective, is it gonna be durable enough for the rigors of uh, law enforcement use? Is it gonna be durable enough for the rigors of everyday carry? Uh, the more often you interact with your handgun, the likelihood of you dropping it increases. If you think about a tightrope, a guy can walk eight feet on a tightrope probably with not much problem at all. But if you make that tightrope 200 miles long, eventually he's gonna slip. That goes to frequency. Uh, the longer you interact with something, the more, the more likely it is for you to have an issue, a mistake, or a negligence issue where the gun gets dropped. Uh, usually it's not that big of a deal. It's kind of a, you know, a scary moment, especially if the firearm's loaded at the time. But since it can happen, or since just the firearm itself can interact with the environment in ways that you don't want it to, such as being impacted by, uh, if you're taking a class or working practice utilizing cover and barriers, or it's in the holster and the holster gets hung up on something, uh, there's all these potential situations where something can be hung up. The more you shoot, the more likely you are to be nodding your head right now because you can remember back to times where that's happened to you or happened to your firearm. This right here is, I was kind of washy on the auto adjust feature. Uh, now I'm going to say it's a hard no. Uh, I'm, I'm going hard no on this optic. Based on the design, there seems to be some structural integrity issues with, with the design of the body uh, that's going to lend itself very well to weak points that are going to destroy the optic or allow the optic to become distorted and there to be obviously bends in the optic body, which a little bit surprising. Um, to the degree that it didn't bend based on an actual shoulder height drop test. The very first optic down shoulder hop drop test, the optic was pretty much rendered inoperable at that point. And the second one just made it worse, obviously. Um, so for me, it's gonna be a hard no on this optic. Uh, if you're gonna put it on a range toy or a little 22 pistol that you use for varmint control or something like that, or a nine millimeter 40 or 45 pistol that you use for varmint control or, or something around the, around the property or around the house, then I'd say, okay, this is a, an inexpensive way to get a red dot on your pistol for something that you're not gonna carry for self-defense. But there is no way, absolutely no way whatsoever that I would put this optic in its, con in its present uh, design and configuration on a self-defense or a duty gun. I really can't make it any more clear than that. I can say this, this, this model is a significant improvement over the J-Point, but I think they've still got a little ways to go when it comes to quality. So if you're trying to save money uh, getting into carrying a red dot handgun, be it for duty or for, or for just general everyday carry concealed self-defense, 
I just can't say this is not the place to go. This is not the optic to look at. You're going to have to look somewhere else, find something else. Now, this is a sample size of one, and that is a caveat that I have to give. Your experience or the, the experience of the guy that you talk to on Facebook or in the gun group you're in and the forms may be different. Um, but I think I've shown through this video just the general usage of it and the fact that I'm, you know, I, I'm willing to spend my own money on this optic and put 2,000 rounds of my own ammunition through it to see if it's going to be good for you. Um, I wanted to do this as objective as possible, even though I've had bad experiences with their product online in the past. I wanted to keep an open mind, see if they've improved, and they have. This is a significant improvement over the J-Point, however, they're still not quite there with the durability for duty or self-defense carry. I'm Aaron Count with Sage Dynamics. Train accordingly.